Okay, I'll call a meeting to order. Good evening, everyone. Um, welcome to our city council meeting. I'll ask the clerk to begin the agenda. Thank you, Worship. First item today is a presentation, and it concerns a recognition of service for superintendent of the RCMP, the officer in charge of our detachment, Sean Maloney, and it's pertaining to the order of merit of police services. <clears throat> Okay, and my notes say first the uh, prior to the presentation the city clerk will be showing the city's video. That is for um, item two. For which the clerk will be showing a video. <laughs> well, that's my honor then. <laughs> There you go, and they were really clear. I want to make it clear that staff were really clear on these notes and that it was my mistake. Um, because, so the, um, okay, we're gonna start over again. I call the meeting to order. <laughs> We'd like to take a moment tonight, uh, our first agenda item, to recognize the work of Superintendent Sean Maloney of the Coquitlam RCMP. Superintendent Maloney has been serving as the officer in charge of the Coquitlam RCMP detachments since April 2015. And last month, he was appointed as a member of the Order of Merit of Police Forces by Governor General David Johnson. The Order of Merit of the Police Forces was established in October 2000 to recognize a commitment to this country and to honor a career of exceptional service or distinctive merit displayed by the men and women of Canadian police services. Members of the order bring distinction to policing and support the concept of police cooperation in public service. If you're not fortunate enough to have worked with Superintendent Maloney, I can tell you he has very much earned this distinction. Superintendent Maloney has a 35-year career in a wide range of police services. He volunteered in community policing initiatives as a school liaison in Trail, in Prince Rupert, and in Agassiz. In Langley, he led a group of colleagues on their time off to build an accessible playground. In Surrey, he challenged subordinates to come up with innovative and creative approaches to address crime. During his time as the officer in charge of E-Division Aboriginal Police Services, he developed a number of initiatives that improved the morale and functionality of his team, improved relations with Aboriginal communities, and developed relations with Aboriginal police officers. In fact, the Ministry of Public Safety and Solicitor General recognized his contributions to building, a positive, relation, to building positive relationships with First Nation communities. And in just two short years in Coquitlam, he is proving his mettle yet again. Superintendent Maloney applied his knowledge from the Surrey and Richmond detachments to help our community build partnerships and prepare for the opening of the Evergreen Extension to SkyTrain and any of the policing implications that that might have on our community. To date, we have seen no significant increases in crime near SkyTrain stations even though 30,000 people are riding it every day. Additionally, in 2016, 95% of residents said they were satisfied with police services in our annual citizenship satisfaction survey, an increase of 2% over 2015. And when you consider how hard it is for a, a city service to get 95% approval, but our police have 95% approval, and the other 5% are the reason we have police. Um, in Coquitlam, we very much value the work of the RCMP. Public safety is usually one of the largest areas of spending in our annual budget, and one of the areas we hear from residents is most, impo is most important to them. How fortunate then that we have someone in charge of the detachment was such a hard-working, respected, and exemplary officer. 
Superintendent Maloney, on behalf of all of us around the council table and everyone in these chambers, I do want to extend our congratulations on this well-deserved recognition. Several of us had the, the opportunity to travel. Uh, Superintendent Maloney took us on a tour of depot uh, in Regina uh, last summer, and we got to see how the respect that the force has for Superintendent Maloney, but also the tremendous admiration and the tremendous um, value he places on the organization that has placed so much faith in him here in Coquitlam. Uh, so on behalf of Coquitlam City Council and my colleagues and everyone here in Coquitlam, thank you for your service and congratulations on this most deserved recognition. Let's give him a round of applause. I think that's the only time I've ever seen him be the only one sitting. <laughs> You're not going to speak, are you? The microphone is open. <laughs> Any objections to him speaking? Seeing none. <laughs> seeing, <laughs> seeing none. Seeing none. No, I wasn't instructing them. Superintendent Maloney. Well, thank you very, very much. I certainly wasn't expecting that and, uh, and wasn't expecting to uh, speak. But, uh, you know, uh, you look back on a career, especially after 35 years, and uh, there's a lot happens, and you kind of trying to sum it up in about two or three minutes. But, you know, I always just think of the people that you work with and work for and people that work for you, really. You're only as good as people that are actually below you, right? I always, uh, there, was, there was somebody that I actually worked for when I only probably had a couple years service and they always, that always kind of stuck, kind of stuck in my mind there. And uh, as I went along in my career, I always thought, is that the way I would have wanted to be treated or is that the kind of person I would want to work for? And uh, everything I do, every day I come to work, I always think of that because really I'm only as good as the people that are sitting up back here, and that was, those are the people that actually I could really credit this uh, MOM award to, really. So thank you very, very much, and I uh, thank Council, because the last two-plus years working with Council, I've certainly learned a lot, and I really appreciate all the support that you've given me. So thank you very, very much. And please pass on as well our congratulations and thanks to the men and women uh, that serve under you, uh, uh, both uh, uh, members of the RCMP and the staff, the QP staff and others and volunteers. We're a great and safe community. We hear it all the time from newcomers that come here and say, wow, this is absolutely amazing. And it's uh, owed uh, in very large part because of the dedication of the members of the RCMP and the folks that work in the detachment. I think there's a video or something. Was there a video now? <laughs> Mr. Clerk. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, our next item pertains to um, a presentation of a professional development award to the city for its leadership development program, Leading with Purpose. Prior to inviting Mr. Jake Rudolph forward, who's here on behalf of the Canadian Association of Municipal, Municipal Administrators, he's our British Columbia representative, uh, we would like to just show a brief video to which the award pertains. A video? Oh, good. Well, she's in the room. We can perhaps get her to, to, to lip-sync the uh, script. Oh, 
and uh, my name is Jake Rudolph. I'm the Deputy City Manager with the City of Abbotsford. I'm the BC representative for the Canadian Association of Municipalities, and I'm here tonight to uh, acknowledge the award on behalf of the Association for the City of Coquitlam. And if I could just read uh, uh, our statement, and uh, that would lead nicely into the, uh, the video. Hopefully that, that will play. So uh, as I mentioned, I'm, I'm the uh, board rep for the uh, CAMA uh, National Board, and this is a national award uh, that's being presented tonight. Uh, I would also acknowledge the city manager and the director of human resources, Nikki Caulfield, for their attendance at the Gatineau Conference, which was held two weeks ago. Um, each year, CAMA recognizes the value of excellence and professionalism in municipal administration through the annual awards program in three areas of program excellence. Awards are presented to local governments and their chief administrators in recognition of their creative and successful programs, projects, or services. The annual awards program has been designed to encourage excellence in the art of professional administration. Success stories are circulated widely across the country and are accessible on the CAMA website. Because Canada has a, a large diversity of municipalities size and sizes, there's three categories of uh, uh, municipal presentations given. One's for uh, under 20,000, uh, between 20 and 100,000, and over 100,000. There's three awards in each of these categories. So this is one of three national awards on the over 100. Uh, thousand category and of course that puts you up against some very tough competition with the very large cities. Uh, the following cr evaluation criteria were used by the evaluation committee when reviewing the submissions. The extent that the program, project or service involves innovation, creativity and exemplifies a significant change, its impact on the profession of municipal administration, the potential a program, project or service possesses to enhance the practices of administrators elsewhere, and to the degree of their transferability to other local governments. The impact of the program, project, or service on the municipality on, and on the organization, even if the innovation itself is not new to the profession, and the sustainability of the results, their long-lasting, positive, measurable effects on the success of the organization. The uh, actual the Professional uh, Development Award recognizes a community that has developed a unique and innovative professional development program for their staff and can be replicated in other communities. This year's winner of the Professional Development Award for a municipality with a population over 100,000 is the City of Coquitlam for your leadership development program, Leading with a Purpose. I'm told the video is now to play. Purpose is an organizational design and philosophy that supports and truly encourages staff to be leaders of themselves, of their clients, and of their teams. For me, leadership is really about creating your best self now. It starts from the moment I wake up in the morning. By being aware of myself, my emotions, my strengths and my weaknesses, I can understand and influence the impact that I have on the organization and those around me. Coquitlam's work in this area is innovative. It's exciting. It's nationally recognized as award-winning. It sets us apart from other employers and puts the best interests of this community that we all serve first. Living starts with self-awareness, knowing who you are, your color insights. It's not the title or position, but your action to positively affect the people around you and the organization as a whole. When this becomes your lifestyle, it will help to shape the future leaders of the city. Well, I've been working for the city for 13 years now. I'm somebody that really likes change, so I thought this program would be a good opportunity for me to grow with this organization and be ready for change, and to also be ready for any future opportunities. Our Leading with Purpose philosophy includes ongoing coaching, real life application, classroom learning, mentorship, self and team exploration, peer support, and multiple learning channels. I was interested in participating in the city's strategic leadership program. Um, I thought it was a fantastic opportunity to learn new skills and there were lots of training opportunities provided by the city uh, to allow me to, to learn and, and, and practice as I grow and advance my career. Um, it's also a really interesting opportunity to help shape the city um, 
you know, and, and give back as the city's in this time of evolution, as it, as it grows and changes, um, I get to be part of that. I think that's uh, really exciting. One of my previous co-workers had been in the program the first time uh, that it was offered and I was quite uh, envious of some of the opportunities that he got uh, and how his profile had uh, grown in the organization as a result of that program. So I also was looking for that opportunity to uh, look to expand my role and to grow my profile in the organization and to prove that I was ready for the next level and to take on more. When you're leading people through changes in an organization, it's really important to listen to what their needs are and also to be open to their experiences. That way, when you're providing them with support, you can lead them in directions that they may not have even thought of yet. With our philosophy, we know that staff need to lead from where they are, to see conflict as an opportunity and realize the potential of giving and receiving effective feedback. This philosophy is more than a leadership development program because at the end of the day, there is no program that can make somebody a leader. Once I realized that we deal with conflict differently, it was much easier to choose the appropriate style while respecting the styles of others. There is really no such thing as prescribed uh, uh, behavior in human interaction. For me, the program highlighted that providing effective feedback is an essential part of leadership. Receiving feedback is how we all learn and develop. And I feel I can apply what I've learned when providing feedback for staff development to build confidence and capacity in the organization, as well as ensuring that others have the right information they need to do their jobs well and feel engaged in a positive work environment. Meeting with purpose is not about getting a certificate or simply showing up. It's about being supported and inspired to work in a way that makes this city, our city, Coquitlam, a better place to live, learn, work and play. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Rudolph. Um, uh, before, um, before we make the actual presentation, I'll note in the video that we just saw that uh, our Director of Human Resources very aptly captures our approach to leadership. Our city's approach is in Coquitlam, leading with purpose is an organizational design and a philosophy. And she's right, it is indeed exciting, although it isn't, doesn't sound as exciting when I say it as when she says it. I've served on Coquitlam City Council since 2005, and I continue to be impressed by the dedication and innovation I see from our city staff, and I know all of council joins in that uh, impression. Uh, and I was especially pleased to see our efforts uh, to develop a Made in Coquitlam leadership program led by Nikki Caulfield and the Human Resources team to see it recognized by the Canadian Association of Professional Administrators in, in late May. Uh, this is truly a testament to the quality, employees, and the service excellence that we have here in Coquitlam. Uh, so Mr. Rudolph, I thank you very much for coming out, and I gather there's a photo that's going to be taken at some point here. Mr. Clerk. Yes, I would like to um, invite Ms. Caulfield to come down and accept the award on behalf of uh, her team and the city. Um, and say a few words. <laughs> <laughs> yes, there is that moment when the, uh, the surprise is apparent. <laughs> Just thank you to council and thank you to the executive team and to the HR team for supporting this program and for helping to move us forward. So thank you very much. And thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, we can get the HR team then. I'm not going to do it alone. There we go. We can go do it back in. <laughs> We're all photo bomb. <laughs> oh, yeah, get back, jeez. No, please block them out. <laughs> it's for staff. Why don't we, we either have me or we have all of count or staff only or all of staff. This is staff. This is staff. This is staff. So please close ranks.
get up. There we go. Mr. Clerk. Our third item this evening is, a, again, a presentation. I'd like to invite the Royal Canadian Air Cadets from the 808 Coquitlam Squadron who are here to, to present their squadron crest and banner to the city. Mayor Stewart, uh, Council, thank you very much for having us. My name is Ernie Budrogi. I'm the chairman of 808 uh, Coquitlam Royal Canadian Air Cadet Squadron. Uh, recently, we just concluded our first training year. We held our annual ceremonial review, and uh, if I do say so myself, it was a successful year. We made it this far. Um, the Royal Canadian Air Cadets is new to Coquitlam. We just started, and uh, I have with us uh, two sergeants and Captain Combo. Uh, Royal Canadian Air Cadets and the way the squadron works basically is a, is a partnership between volunteer parents, such as myself, and the Department of National Defense. Together, we deliver a program of training, leadership, and integrity, and learning for young, uh, young aspiring cadets. So these would be children from the age of 12 to 18. We have approximately 106 all ranks on parade now. And we all come from the Coquitlam area, and we're centered in the Millard, uh, Millard Middle School right now. That's where our, our, our most of our training takes place. Um, I want to thank you again for having us. I'd like Captain Combo to speak a little bit to the training program that we, we offer uh, cadets. Thank you, Captain. Hello, Your Worship, Council. Again, uh, I work for the National or D Department of National Defense to d deliver the cadet program. Cadet program, the Air Cadet program, specifically 12 to 18 years of youth. Uh, we deliver leadership, citizenship, uh, aviation training, physical fitness, biathlon, drill team, band, and just an overall place for youth to grow. City support is vital to our success, and for the year that we've been here, it's been excellent, and we look to be a staple in this community for a long time, and we are honored to be here. Thank you. Right. So, uh, in, in conclusion, I, I would just like to, to offer our assistance in any way with the city, for, with our color party, with our, uh, our flag party, and of course with our band, so that we could increase our exposure to the city, uh, in, within this city, because we, we do wish to grow. We're only 106 now, we're shooting for 150 next year, and in the following year, hopefully 200. We probably max out at that stage, but we certainly need more exposure in the city. So um, anything we can do uh, to increase that exposure, I'm very keen to do so. So with that, uh, sergeants, I'd like to present our banner. It's signed by all the cadets uh, from our annual ceremony review. And uh, thank you, Councillor uh, Asmundson, for attending the annual ceremony review. And thank you for the idea to present it to Council instead. So you're welcome. Outstanding. Thank you very much. I, I must say, um, with deference to the, your branch, uh, I'm a former Army cadet, uh, cadet major at the Vernon Army Cadet Camp, so I, um, I know the value of cadets in building community and in building uh, young people, and I thank you very much for the work that you do as a volunteer and the work that the Corps does, and absolutely wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. You still fit it? No. <laughs> Go ahead. You can photograph right here.
Okay, it's my honor as well to recognize uh, we have a visitor in the uh, Council Chambers uh, School Trustee, Barb Hobson is here. I thank her very much for joining in uh, with such keen interest in our deliberations. She's here to announce a new school, is that? Oh. oh. <laughs> Just one? Okay. okay, we won't put that much pressure on her. Mr. Clerk. Thank you, Your Worship. Next item, item four, concerns minutes of the regular council meeting held on Monday, June 12th. Um, the recommendation is to approve as amended, and I just wanted to draw council's attention to the error that the clerk's office wanted to fix. On page four of the minutes, um, the resolution contains a typographical error. It says resolution number 265, and it should be 285 as it speaks to the resolution immediately prior. Um, and that is the amendment that we'd like to propose. So the recommendation from staff is that minutes of the Rider Council meeting be approved as amended. So moved. Second. Move by Councillor Asmussen, second by Councillor Towner. All in favor? Opposed? Approved as amended. <clears throat> Item 5 pertains to the fourth and final reading of the noise regulation, construction hours, amendment bylaw number 4739, and the bylaw notice enforcement amendment, construction noise bylaw number 4778. Staff recommendations that Council give fourth and final reading to noise regulation, construction hours, amendment bylaw number 4739, and fourth and final reading to bylaw notice enforcement amendment, construction noise bylaw number 4778. Moved by Councillor Marsden, seconded by Councillor Zorillo. All in favor? Opposed? Carried unanimously. Item 6 pertains to recreational and commercial vehicle parking regulations in residential zones. This is zoning amendment bylaw. Recreational and Commercial Vehicles, number 4741. Staff recommendations that Council give first reading to Zoning Amendment Bylaw, Recreational and Commercial Vehicles, number 4741, and that Zoning Amendment Bylaw number 4741 be referred to public hearing. Moved by Councillor O'Neill, second by Councillor Hodge. Councillor Reed. Yes, on page 4, um, the top paragraph, Recreational Commercial Vehicle Ownership. In the third line from the top, it says that the zoning amendment includes a requirement that recreational commercial vehicles parked or stored in residential zones be owned by an owner or occupier of the property. So um, was it supposed to be and occupier or we're going to allow a distinction between... So if I owned a building and I rented it to Bonita, I could still park my big RV outside? while she's renting it. I thought we were trying to stop that. Through the chair to Councillor Reed, the intention is that it would be, um, it would be for the, 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 the either, either the resident of the house, the, you know, which could be the owner and or a renter. It wasn't intended for that if the, if the, if it was a non-resident owner to park the, for them to park their RV on a, on the property, which is, which he or she is renting out to somebody else. That's what I thought, but I think this way it could be read that way. So I could own the property, go park my RV there, and then rent it to you. You wouldn't like that. That's how I'm reading it. Maybe perhaps I'm reading it wrong. Yeah, if we go to the back page or the second page of the bylaw, which is attachment two, two thirds of the way down the page at G, G, recreation vehicles or commercial vehicles not owned by the occupant or owner of the property. So in the bylaw language as well, it allows that either the owner or, or whether, whether resident or not, or the occupier of the property could own the recreation vehicle or commercial vehicle. Yeah. Um, I, I'm, not, I'm just interpreting, I'm not forming an opinion here yet. Mr. Fuji. Um, if, should it be council desire to, so that there's no confusion, one, one option may be under, on, of, on item G of the bylaw, to strike out or owner of the property. So it would just read uh, recreational vehicles or commercial vehicles uh, not owned by the occupant. An occupant could either be uh, a renter or, or the owner or the uh, or an owner resident. I, I thought it was who um, 
That's not what I thought. I thought if you, if I owned the property, um, unless I was occupying it, I shouldn't be parking my RV there. But it's going to a public hearing, so let's let the public have their say, and we'll deal with it at that time. Thank you. Okay. Um, I've got Councillor Asmussen. Thank you. I just have a, a, a few questions on this um, by all that's coming forward. Um, so we have a 7.6 meter driveway length, and so about 25 feet, and we are allowing two vehicles, either a boat on a trailer or a motorhome, to be parked on a driveway if you have a driveway that meets the 7.6 meters. Is that correct? Through the, through the, through the chair to Councillor Asmundson, the, the intent of the bylaw is if I can, we can step back a bit. Um, when, the, when this matter was first brought forward to Council and Committee, um, there was an issue, or I guess a question brought up that, gee, if I have an extraordinary long driveway in my residence, you know, why, why, why couldn't I park a, a longer RV? So uh, staff took that back and um, being mindful of the fact that under the um, unsightly premises bylaw, you can only no matter how long your, your driveway in a residential zone, you're, all, you're, you're limited to, to two, a uh, combination of a boat, RV, two RVs, two boats, that sort of thing. What we had said is that, you know, if, if your particular driveway is longer than 7.6 meters, you, you could accommodate, say, an eight meter or nine meter length RV. Um, and, if, if, and if by chance your, your, your driveway was um, 50 feet, it could allow for two 7.6 meter length, um, either combination of two RVs, RV or boat. So that that's uh, the how the, how the bylaw has been uh, being proposed. So by this bylaw, technically, going forward, if this gets approved after the public hearing, you could have two motorhomes parked on a driveway, blocking up the whole driveway, blocking up the whole garage, and that would be fine. It wouldn't, and so that's what this bylaw would allow. Mr. Fuki. Who the chair to Councillor Asmundson, the bylaw would allow two RVs or a combination of an RV or a boat on a driveway which is uh, 50 feet long. Um, but you could park side by side. If you had one vehicle, you have a 7.6 meter driveway and you had a motorhome that's under 7.6, you could park it on the driveway and you could park a Boat on the driveway because they could be because you have you're allowed two. Um, through, through the chair to Councilor Atkinson, um, there there are as as Council is aware there there are other uh, off street parking requirements prescribed in the zoning bylaw. So for example, if someone had a, a secondary suite or those sort of things that that would likely preclude that 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 the the two happening because you'd have to have a dedicated space for a secondary suite. Um, I suppose there, there be, could be situations where there's large estate type lots where, you know, again, a, long, a longer driveway um, could perhaps accommodate the, the two, but um, the intent in the bylaw, you know, wasn't, we, we hadn't envisioned uh, a, a boat and an RV parked on a, a driveway in front of a, a front of a garage. I suppose that possibility could exist, but again, there there are other parking requirements that a, a, a you know a property in a in a in a residential zone would have to satisfy, though. Well, I, and I think some of the problems we're having with this one is going to go to a public hearing, but um, we're going to be dealing at the next public hearing the issue of the front loaded parking issue and some other parking issues. And I, I, I'm going to find it interesting on that discussion uh, in regards to some people are talking about requiring a third parking spot on a front loaded as being um, unsightly, and yet we are going to allow potentially a motorhome or t uh, two motorhomes, if they're shorter, on the driveways, blocking up the driveway and blocking up the usage. So I think, you know, right now we're going to be dealing with this here. Um, I have some concerns about that. I don't mind. I don't like it on the driveway. I think it's going to create uh, an unsightly look, and it's going to put more cars on the street because it's going to be blocking the driveway. If you've got a motorhome on it, if you had a car on a long driveway and you can sort of move around that car on a long driveway, 
but you've got motorhomes up there. You're, we're putting the owner's cars on the street, let alone if there's a, a tenant within that street. I think we have to be aware of those factors. I also think when I looked, I think I, I want to thank Councillor Reed because I remember we were talking about this before in our discussion going back. And when I look at here, all zones, and I look at RS7, RS8 lots, I have no idea of how. On a front loaded, you, I can't see it because most of them are less than 7.6 meters. And if it's on a rear loaded, we require a third parking pad on the rear. So I, I can't see how you could include for practicality purposes, an RS7, RS8, even within this bylaw, that I, I just it seemed to me by looking at the width of those properties between 33 and 40 feet, that front or back loaded, that you can get a motorhome or a boat within there without removing the parking pad for the, the third spot for the tenant at the back that we require. I think going forward, those two areas should be omitted from the bylaw as I don't think they will work. Um, as I said, I don't mind where this started from was a person parking their car, their motorhome along the side of a property. You've got a wide enough property to park on the side, off the driveway or something, or in the backyard. I think Council Reed said before, you've got a big enough backyard where you're not affecting it, you can park in the back, fine. But I think when we also get into the other issues about the other bylaw, about parking issues on the street, people not using the garages. By allowing people to park all these vehicles in front of their garages just adds to more parking on the streets, going to add to more issues. So I'm not supportive at this time. I'm going to move the, the bylaw forward for public hearing, but I have a lot of great concerns with this bylaw going forward the way it's, it's written. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor O'Neill. Yes, just for clarification here. Um, my understanding that the unsightly premises bylaw of 1998 allows uh, a property to, uh, to have any a two of any combination of recreational vehicle or boat trailer uh, already, and that's been in existence for two decades. Um, the big change here are the um, well. I just I didn't want the public to be confused about this. We're not introducing a whole brand new thing about suddenly allowing two vehicles. Um, the, the, big, the big change uh, that's pertinent to the discussion of the last five minutes is that uh, we are now allowing, um, we're not limiting the, the size of the, total size of the vehicles to the size of, the, of that smaller uh, um, driveway. Now we, we're taking into account the fact that there exists in the city some very long driveways, and if you have a very long driveway, then you can, you're not going to be allowed to have any more than two vehicles still, but they can be now bigger than the two vehicles that were allowed under the old bylaw. So that old bylaw has been there for almost 20 years. Uh, we're not introducing a brand new thing here, suddenly jamming two RVs onto a, a driveway where we've never had two RVs or an RV in a boat or something like that before. We've always allowed, we've allowed that for 20 years for 19 years here, so um, I just want to get that on the record as far as I'm concerned. Is, that, is my interpretation of that right, uh, Mr. Chair? Maybe Mr. Fuji or somebody can answer that. Uh, Mr. Fuji. Th through the Chair to Councillor Neal, um, um, yes, that's correct. Under, under the unsightly premises bylaw law from 1998, um, you're currently allowed to have um, or you're strict, you, you are restricted to, to two, so I guess one could argue that you're allowed up to two, but yeah, I'm at, uh, two, two under, under those bottles, that's correct. And we're still going to be restricted for two under, to two under the new bylaw, even, um, even though they could be a little longer now because if you have a longer driveway, is that right? Yeah, that's correct. The, the intent of the bylaw amendment is to, is, a, is to align the two bylaws together, the zoning bylaw and the unsightly premises bylaw. Perfect. Thank you very much. Thank you. Councillor Zerillo? just had a couple of questions. Um, my first comments would be that folks are trying to find creative ways to generate revenue off of their property. So um, I can see one of those ways being uh, offering their driveways for recreational vehicles. And I guess I'm just wondering about cord 
driveways after the fact or extended poor drives after the fact how do we accommodate for that because if we open this up and people have space on their yards they can potentially pour asphalt and then have a longer driveway and it seems ridiculous except for the fact that it did actually happen on my street where someone just went ahead and asphalted their front garden to put a recreational vehicle so what what would be in place um, I mean, these are some of the unintended consequences that come along with opening up something that only gets five or six complaints a year in which some of them aren't even uh, valid that, that people are actually in compliance. But I just want to understand that. What if, what if we get a rush of people just asphalting their front yards or extending their current driveway length as they can uh, to put boats in recreational vehicles? How do we... against that happening or do we care I threw the chair to Councillor Zarillo um, I suppose I again I'll, I'll preface my, my my comments by saying that the um, um, and as and as Councillor Zarillo has pointed out we haven't had um, you know like a whole bunch of complaints about you know illegally or oversized RVs or those sort of things parked in, in residential zones. Um, and, you know, I know we've had in the past some complaints about folks putting additional, shall we say, hard surface in their front yards to accommodate, you know, um, additional vehicles. Um, however, there are limitations, again, technically based upon the zoning or the subdivision development bylaw you know, the maximum widths of things like driveways and uh, or driveway crossings at the property line. So they would make it very difficult to, you know, to, um, for the maneuvering and all those other sort of technical requirements under various bylaws, uh, again, to, to, to legally to do that sort of scenario where you might have, you know, an additional, you know, some, uh, a previous lawn area asphalted or hard surfaced over for an RV. Um, there, there's some practical consideration which I think would make it very difficult, um, to, you know, to, to to do that and, and meet all of the you know the various requirements under our various bylaws. Well, I'm going to say thank you for those comments, and it seems that that would be true, but unfortunately, people are doing unprecedented things in unprecedented times. So usually, I do like to hear from residents about their thoughts and like to see most things go to uh, public hearing, but. Uh, I just, in, in a time when people can't afford a home and we're having incredible difficulty getting uh, rental housing for people, I just could not, in good conscience, have the staff working on, on any more of this because there, there most likely will be um, additions and inputs later. So I, I'm sorry to say I'm, I'm not going to be uh, supporting it, pushing it through. I think its priority is pretty low on the scale based on the current environment in Coquitlam. Thank you. Thank you. I've got um, a couple of uh, questions on. Uh, I'm looking at the bylaw itself, the language on the bylaw 2.1.1. Um, it, it refers to a number of things that are construction equipment, including construction or commercial trades vehicles, and uh, doesn't define uh, construction or com commercial trades vehicles. Uh, would that include a cube van? Would it include a F-350 pickup truck? I should have let you answer the cube van one first. <laughs> through, the, through, um, through, the, through, the, through, the, through to the chair, uh, yes, it, 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 it could include a, a, a cube van used for, for commercial purposes. Okay, but not a pickup truck, which could actually be larger than the cube van. Um, I'm, I'm, I struggle because there's one not far from my home where I would suggest that there are certainly two F-350 pickup trucks with the logo, company logo emblazoned on all sides, and uh, a couple of trailers, and uh, my, by my recollection, um, I think there's a boat there too, but it's not connected to the, the business that runs out of the, the driveway. Um, but there is, you know, it's clearly a commercial property as you drive down the street because of the sheer volume of commercial vehicles. And I gather that all of those would be permitted 
um, under this bylaw. I re recognizing that the bylaw can't be all things, but um, uh, if a pickup truck is not a commercial vehicle, uh, or rather, a pickup truck is not a construction or commercial trades vehicle, um, then that's that's been made clear, Mr. Fuji. Where, where, uh, where, uh, where, 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 sort of staff had some trucks where, where we struggled in, in, in drafting the proposed bylaw amendments is that, you know, there there are situations where you might have a fellow who's in a commercial business, but his his day to day vehicle is his uh, is his truck, which he also uses for his business. So those are the areas that 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 we did struggle with, and. Um, you know, we, we the bylaw tries to address those those sort of situations, and I don't know if uh, uh, my my colleague to the right can add uh, some of those situations. Ms. James, our uh, solicitor, go ahead. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, putting on my bylaw enforcement hat, uh, our division was involved uh, in the drafting of this language and arrived at a mix of. Uh, things that we think the community would generally understand to be contractor's equipment. I appreciate that there's never going to be 100% precision with that definition, and that's actually purposeful so that it, we can adapt to the situations we see as they come. It's meant to be uh, informative, but still allowing some discretion to deal with unique situations as they arise. I think Mr. Fuji did a good job of explaining one type of area where our, our officers would use discretion, and that's uh, a resident who whose work truck, uh, perhaps a, a larger model uh, pickup truck, also happens to be his personal vehicle. So it's you know got the kids uh, booster seats in it in the on the weekend, but uh, contractor's equipment on the week. Uh, that's generally not the level of detail that we're going to be getting to. We're more concerned about the big cube vans and the more obvious commercial vehicles in residential neighborhoods. No, understood entirely, and I, I concur. Um, I guess uh, occasionally you'll run into a situation where. It's not the size of the vehicle, but the number of corporate vehicles on the front uh, driveway that becomes the issue. And I don't see the clause that says vehicles uh, similar to our home-based business bylaw where um, something is uncharacteristic of a residential neighborhood or some, not, in character, not in keeping with the character of a residential neighborhood. And Your Worship, we deal with that in, uh, again through enforcement. Um, going back to first principles, these are residentially zoned properties. These are not commercially zoned properties. So if uh, in the totality of the circumstances we can look at it and say, you know, you having your eight commercial trucks there no longer makes this a residential property. This is now your commercial parking lot. That's a zoning violation. First principles, it's, it's no longer a residential lot. Okay. Um, Thank you. That's helpful. Um, uh, going to the next page of the bylaw, that's at D. That's 2.1.3 sub D. Um, and there's a couple of places where the 1.8 meters fence or landscaping uh, comes into play as a barrier against the uh, um, uh, against the RV or vehicle. And I. And that I hear one of my colleagues suggesting, well, what, what happens when one's twice, twice as high, or what happens when one is um, parked higher than the base of the fence? And we saw that in one situation where the where the vehicle was actually elevated somewhat from the adjacent property, and therefore, you know, the, a put a, a six foot fence um, uh, from the on the property line would make it such that uh, the only four feet of the fence or three feet of the fence actually blocked the motorhome. And I, I don't know how to get past that other than to suggest that the fence must be measured on the, above the surface on which the vehicle is parked or something like that. But uh, and that may well be um, handled some other way. I'll only raise that concern. I'll go to F now at I, 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 I. Um, the last, um, okay, but anyway, it says the length of the property's driveway and contiguous parking pad, if present, exceeds 7.6 meters. In other words, um, uh, commercial vehicles uh, can't be parked there. Um, if it's greater than 7.6 meters, and the length of the property's driveway, driveway uh, and contiguous parking pad, is, if present, exceeds 7.6 meters, in which case the length of the commercial vehicle must not exceed the length of the driveway and then for, for some reason we use and again, 
Um, because if you have a, if you have a, that contiguous parking pad that's only a car length in, in length, only 15 feet long, um, it would restrict the length of vehicle that you could park on the driveway, even if the driveway was longer. So I don't know that and can fit there. Um, I think it has to be, um, in fact, I don't know that the contiguous parking pad means anything. Sorry. I don't know that uh, the contiguous parking pad, if the vehicle isn't on the park, contiguous parking pad, what does its length have to do with how long the vehicle can be? If you don't have a parking pad next to your driveway, you can park a really long vehicle. But if you have a small parking pad next to your driveway, you're not allowed to park the long vehicle on the driveway because both the driveway and the contiguous parking pad must be longer than 7.6 meters. I'm just, it, it doesn't, that one doesn't work um, from my perspective. But it's the maximum length of 15.2 meters. If all of those conditions apply, if you have a really long driveway and a long contiguous parking pad at once present, um, uh, you're allowed to go to a 50 foot long commercial vehicle. 50 feet, um, a typical container is 40 feet, Ty right. typical shipping container, not the 20 foot short stubbies, but the, the regular shipping container is 40 feet, and an ultra long shipping container is 45 feet, and we're gonna permit a commercial vehicle on the front yard of a residential neighborhood with a long driveway, say something in a cul-de-sac perhaps, that's up to 50 feet long. That seems, 15.2 meters goes to 49.87 feet. I don't think we meant to allow a maximum length of a commercial vehicle on a front driveway of 50 feet. Yeah, again, no, 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 this is commercial. Mr. Fuji. To the chair, um, again, uh, reflecting back on, on, on Ms. James' original comments about first principles in terms of commercial use and those sort of things. Um, and again, you know, she can speak further to that, but if it would seem to me that a, a 50 foot long commercial vehicle um, would again would be inconsistent with the or uncharacteristic of a of a, of a typical of, of a use within a residential zone, and um, uh, would you know, or could be the subject of a of an enforcement uh, a situation. Okay, so we would be willing to enforce against a commercial vehicle parked on a driveway, specifically as directed by this bylaw on the grounds that for some other reason it wasn't acceptable. And I'm, I'm not certain I'm comfortable with that. I think I'm more comfortable um, uh, not contradicting uh, how we intend to enforce it. Mr. McIntyre. Yes, thank you, Worship, uh, and good evening. Um, I, I think what we've been trying to do here is apply uh, a general approach that uh, may be more applicable around an RV. It's a little longer as long as the driveway can handle it, and, and it's been rolled over to the commercial vehicle side. So let us look at that. Um, we've noted down there's been a number of questions and comments uh, raised by council this evening, which is appropriate. You know, this is the first reading consideration where um, I'm trusting that we'll be going to a public hearing. Um, some of these questions and comments we can uh, try to address through the public hearing brief. And um, I think as was noted at the public hearing, there's an opportunity for further discussion for input on this. And at that point, uh, council can deal with the bylaw um, amended if need be, if, if that's what's desired at that time. And uh, uh, there may be some pieces in here right now that are just a little, a little too far. Um, and uh, uh, that could be uh, revised later. Okay, no, I, I, I understand, and that's why I wasn't raising the question related to E, which is recreation vehicles. Um, it seems to me a class A motorhome, et cetera. I, I understand that one. It's the commercial vehicles that are 49 feet long, it just doesn't, doesn't seem to, to, to fit from my perspective. Um, as well, on both of those, there's the use of the, and I think I now understand how I misunderstood the contiguous parking. 
uh, is the contiguous parking space in line with the driveway or beside the driveway? I took it to be beside the driveway, in which case its length is irrelevant. Um, but yeah, I suppose you could have meant that it's... Your Worship, it would be adjacent or parallel. So I think parallel, parallel. to the driveway. So it should be or, not and. It should it's be or, or, not and. Good. Yes. Thank you. Um, and then back to uh, the, the length, be it 15.2 meters or some other measurement on both um, E and F. I worry that um, many people consider their driveway to extend all the way to the curb uh, if they don't have a sidewalk on their side of the street or perhaps to the sidewalk if they do. Um, I think the driveway should be that portion of the driveway on private property. Uh, and I, I, see, I see nods, so I, I see some perhaps tweaking of this so that they can't argue that, no, oh, it's, it's my driveway. You, it's shown on the plans as a driveway and whatever. So, Mr. Fuji. Yes, uh, through the chair, just, just to confirm that that's correct. The, uh, the, 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 length, the length of the driveway would be measured from the, um, from the legal front property line and not from, you know, um, where the gravel might be or where the boulevard might be. It, it is from the front property line back. Okay, and I don't see that as a defined term, but maybe we need to define it. Okay. I don't see any other questions. Sorry for taking so long with those uh, small details. Anybody else? The question is first reading. Um, is staff comfortable at this point going forward, or have we raised enough questions? It's up. Uh, Mr. McIntyre, I'd look to you for advice. Uh, yes, thanks, Your Worship, for asking, because I, I was <laughs> pondering that in my own mind. Um, one thought that I, has occurred to me, I think what we want to do is, because uh, we've been at this for a while, is uh, a little uh, a comparison, you know, what's in the bylaw now, what's being proposed to change, and um, that may be helpful for reference. Um, and then my earlier comments around, there's a, by, a, a proposed bylaw now that's going to public hearing, um, and, and that's the intention, is to have uh, that input from the public, um, that further discussion. Um, we will try to respond on some of the questions we've heard tonight from Council in our public hearing brief as our ordinary course. At that point, following the conclusion of the public hearing, Council has some decisions, you know, either proceed on with the bylaw as written, you can refer it back to staff, you can decline it. Um, where we have to be careful if, if we're, we're, we're starting to delete some of the proposed requirements in a way that it's uh, um, more restrictive than what had been in place before. So I, I'd have to look closely at that with the staff and probably discuss it with the city clerk. So we've been in a position to um, better advise you at that time. Again, my sense would be, and this is why I'd, I'd really like to have a, a comparison table, because I think where we're going with some of these requirements, it's above and beyond what we have now. So if at the end of the day, following the public hearing, they don't, they don't get council support, I think they can be struck from the bylaw because it's, it's, it's not um, changing the regulations that are in place today, if you get what I mean. But let, let us look at that. We'll have that more firmly in hand at the time. Mr. Clerk, which uh, public hearing is this heading towards? We'll be heading towards the public hearing at the end of July. And the deadline for first reading on that public hearing? Probably ju it's just July 10th. So it is possible for us to um, defer or refer back to staff and have um, everyone more comfortable at first reading or what it, and I, I, I'm more concerned with what staff uh, think might be more appropriate because they're the ones who are going to have to make this work. I think I'm looking at in hearing what Mr. McIntyre said, I think <clears throat> hey, there's some work that staff can do in order to do that analysis. If staff feels we've reached a point before that date, I think we can identify ourselves. Or what, what tools are available to make changes that night while respecting the public hearing process? And such things as Mr. McIntyre noted, it's not as if there would be a vacuum or um, a lack of regulation. It would just be the existing regulation would continue. So I think... Um, Maybe at this stage, and what I heard from Mr. McIntyre, who's more familiar with the content than myself, um, planning development is comfortable going forward, and that if a change needed to be made in the meantime, they can make a council aware. 
Mr. McIntyre. Uh, yes, thank you, Worship, and I, I, I would uh, concur with the city clerk. Let us have a look at it. My sense is that we can go forward, but if I'm mistaken, if we, if we need to bring it back to council with a bylaw, you know, option A, option B, we can do that. Um, it's just a bit of a rush, but we can we can do that. But my, my sense is that we should be able to bring it forward, have the public hearing, and then, um, depending on the extent of the changes uh, directed at that time, it can't be done. But uh, let, let, let us let staff look at it, and we will confer with the city clerk's department. So I anticipate us giving first reading today and a do-over if you think that that's most be. appropriate. Councillor Reed. Yes, my question has to do with who do you send notice to the public hearing on something like this? Mr. Clerk. Because what I'm gathering, and maybe this may change our mind as to where we go, is that staff is looking for input from the public, which would be those folks who own recreational vehicles or have home businesses or such. So how are you going to... Um, Give notice. In, in instances uh, related to bylaws of this type, it, it would simply be a newspaper ad. Uh, if, if a bylaw amendment affects 10 or more properties with 10 or more owners, um, you, you do not have to notify in certain ways. But the more, the more challenging part is, who would you send a letter to both in terms, because we don't have the tools to identify where these might be or where they might be in the future, right? It may be a subsequent owner to today that, that may be impacted. So. Um, I get that, Mr. Gilbert, but what I'm wondering is perhaps we need a piece of um, educational, you know, verbiage to go out before to say that council will be having a public hearing on uh, recreational, commercial, you know, whatever, and so that we, can, the people who own these things can at least say, well, gee, I better get my butt over and look at that. Because if we don't have the people who have all these little wheelie things, then we're not going to get the information that we're looking for to put in an appropriate bylaw. But in such, in such a case, you would be required to send that notice to all property owners of the zoning that is affected by this? That would, that would be in... How would we know that, I guess? We wouldn't know that. So, so know. The, the, the answer would be that we would not be providing a mailed out notice. We would not be providing signs. We would simply be running, um, in our case, three ads in the paper. And I think if we had an ad saying that this was up and coming within the next month or so, that might help. I don't know. Just my two cents. Thank you. We do provide more newspaper ads than required. Our goal is to, to make people as aware as possible. Yeah, um, I want to hear from folks. And as, as do we. we. We take that part seriously. I just think in some instances, and, and the legislation recognizes that it's simply not possible to uh, provide mailed notice in certain Oh, I get that. Thank you. Um, Two, two other, um, one other component and then one other process question. The component question is, on that day when uh, you go pick up your RV that's in storage and bring it to your front yard to load it, um, are there provisions to allow that for 48 hours uh, you can store your, you can have your vehicle parked on your property? Um, my neighbor does this um, every spring and fall. The snowbirds, uh, they load up the, and you can tell he's going to go away because his, his motorhome's in his front yard for two days. And I wouldn't want a bylaw that a, a particularly um, stin, uh, stickler of a neighbor could make life hard for them to simply load up their, their van to head out. Ms. James. Uh, Your Worship, that's, uh, I've conferred with my colleague, Ms. Bull. She agreed that that's something that our officers deal with quite routinely as a matter of discretion when talking to uh, the homeowner who may have come on our radar because of a complaint from the neighbor. Okay, and you're comfortable with, uh, with no language? Yep. Fair enough, good. And my last one then is um, I don't perceive a rush here. Uh, we've actually, this has been before council quite some time, and, uh, and the there isn't a measure of urgency, and so I guess my, my challenge with it is that we'll be publishing an ad sometime in the second or third week of July aimed at people who go on vacation in the summer. And it might be appropriate to simply um, take our time and make sure that, um, that uh, they're able to participate. I lived in a neighborhood where uh, Councillor Hodge, or, or Mr. Hodge, as he, as he then was, his committee uh, on traffic calming, um, put out a report to Council at the beginning of July. <laughs> Sorry to single you out. <laughs> put out a report to Council, and Council made the decision to go to uh, um, a reverse um, onus uh, 
petition to determine whether the traffic calming would take place, but the petition was out from the third week of July to the third week of August. And when we got back from holidays and found out that we had missed it, um, as a result, we, there was a big effort to turn it around and eventually all the traffic calming measures were ripped out. Um, so I, I would rather us make sure that uh, we respect the fact that this is targeted at those people who uh, head off for long periods of the summer. Mr. Mr. McIntyre. Um, yes, thank you, Worship. Uh, interesting question. Um, take the point. Um, uh, if people are on the road, they won't be at a public hearing. Um, we do it in the fall. We want to do it before the, the uh, snowbirds head south, too. So um, on this one, though, I, I'll, I'll defer to my, my colleague, the city clerk. Um, I believe the city's uh, system is that um, we tend to refer bylaws to upcoming meetings, uh, uh, public hearings, unless specified by council. So I think if that's the direction of council to uh, refer the bylaw to a public hearing in September, I, I, I think that uh, uh, would be um, procedurally acceptable. I, I, I don't think there's any uh, danger with that, but I'd let uh, the city clerk speak to that part of it. Uh, thank you, Mr. McIntyre, uh, and and the general manager is is correct. We could we could direct that this appear on the public hearing bylaw in in September. In this case, it would be September 18th. Um, the notices would would still go out uh, 12 days before that date, so it would be just shortly after Labor Day. Um, but Labor Day is the typical date of return for those who have children in schools, so um, it, it may meet that need. Um, Whereas July may be more problematic. I, I take the point, um, and that's indeed possible if council so directs. Okay, Councillor Marsden. Thank you. Um, I want to thank staff for the work they've done on this because I think it's important that we we do uh, re revisit the rules that, that we've got in place. So thank you for the work you've done on it. There's obviously some some questions on it still. Um, Mr. McIntyre just pointed out the the comment I was going to make with regards to looking at deferring this later. Uh, a lot of the larger vehicles may, no, the mayor made the comment about potentially deferring it. Mr. McIntyre's comment was about doing it before the snowbirds head south. And uh, a lot of the larger vehicles quite possibly are, are owned by, by folks that are heading south for, for several months of the year. So um, if there's a possibility to do it in September, I think that would be fine. But I wouldn't want to defer it any longer than that because uh, I think you run the risk of... Uh, shutting out folks that uh, could be mostly impacted in terms of owning owning these larger vehicles. Um, so um, I, I think this is, the, the work that we've got here is, is good. We certainly have some folks that do have larger vehicles. They, they've got them in the yards, and I think from an affordability perspective, folks choose to have these because they find these um, these RVs more economical from, from family vacations than, than staying in staying in hotels and, and getting away that way. Uh, and the added expense of several hundred dollars a month to store them on somebody's private lot is uh, is very prohibitive for them. So very happy to see the work the staff have done. Uh, obviously, the commercial component of it does cause some challenge. Uh, and, and I look forward to seeing what you've got prepared for us and the comparatives in terms of what the, the changes are and uh, so we can move forward. So I'm fully going to support this and, uh, and as we move forward to public hearing, I am flexible on the date, though, if, the, if it's the will of council to, to look at September 18th uh, at, the extent, at the suggestion of the clerk, I'd be, I'd be fine with that. Thanks. <clears throat> so first reading is before us. Um, I, I heard Councillor Asmussen I would move that, so I assume he means adding the phrase uh, to the to a public hearing in September. That's right. So the amendment by Councillor Asmundson, seconded by Councillor O'Neill, is to add in September to recommendation number two. Any further discussion on that? All in favor of the amendment? All opposed? The amendment carries unanimously. The motion as amended. Any further discussion? First reading in a public hearing in September. All in favor? Opposed? Councillor Zarillo is opposed. The motion carries. Next item, item 7, pertains to the Parks, Recreation and Culture Master Plan for the years 2015 to 2030, and it's the approval of that master plan. Staff recommendations that Council endorse the Parks, Recreation and Culture Master Plan 2015 to 2030, which forms attachment 1 of the report of the General Manager uh, that is before you. Um, we have introductory comments by the General Manager, and we have a presentation by the General Manager Technology. 
It says it's dead. It's dead. Turn mine back on. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Alaweva. Well, um, this plan is so important, it has two GMs working on it. Um, <laughs> I do a lot have of the other, assistance. A lot of other GMs are able to handle important items all by themselves. I do want to say that without Michelle's assistance, uh, we certainly wouldn't have had the success we have had. Um, just a couple moments to just for introductory comments. Uh, um, I guess this is a, a proud moment for our department. Uh, it is the sum total of many years, actually three years of work. Um, uh, we did start it just after I arrived in the department. Um, it had been started but uh, a few times, but um, I think we got it going, and it really has become a very transformational document, a um, very transformational piece of work for our department, not, not just because of what it represents from a resource uh, for the community, for this council, for our staff as a, as a living, working document, but also the, the, the philosophy, the strategies, and, and all of the elements that make it um, um, what it is. Um, so I do want to thank our entire team. Michelle Hunt uh, was the leader of this project, uh, but we've had the assistance of many, many people, not just in the Parks, Rec, and Culture team, but throughout the city and various departments. Uh, corporate communications, all of the various departments that assisted us in putting this together. Um, the plan um, does represent um, really a direction and a way forward. Um, it, it is our course um, and it is intended to, to try to give us a sense of where the very valuable range of uh, park recreation and cultural services that we are currently providing and how we, how we can continue to serve the community well. Um, for for what is going to be very much uh, and continues to be a growing population and, and a growing community that continues to desire um, a, a broad and um, um, a high level of park recreational cultural services. Um, the plan is very comprehensive, um, and is, but at the same time, it, it is a very adaptable plan. Um, it, it does underscore that there's many, many things we're going to need as the community grows. Um, it takes the approach that uh, it's this council and this community that will set the level of service that we want in the various areas of service, and we've highlighted 18 of them in our service wheel. Um, but there are methods, and there is a science, and there's data, and all of that is, is important to understanding where each of these service areas can go. Um, but it will be this council that decides on an annual uh, basis how to provide those services and uh, what resources to uh, um, to put into those. So with that, I will uh, allow Michelle to give us a brief presentation of council wishes. Um, I've probably stolen most of her thunder. I do that most of the time, but um, I do present to council Michelle Hunt, the leader of this project, and my thanks to Michelle. Uh, good evening, Your Worship and Council. So I am putting on my Parks, Recreation and Culture hat uh, for the last time for this presentation. And I am honored to be presenting the Parks, Recreation and Culture Master Plan on behalf of the department. Um, as Mr. Alueva mentioned, this has been truly a team undertaking uh, with the input of staff working across our entire organization, uh, the support of the management team, the ongoing vision, direction, and leadership from the general manager, Ms. Dalueva. And most importantly, this document is based on the input from our partners, our residents, the public, and yourselves. I'd like to briefly walk you through the steps that have been taken to develop the plan, the guiding principles upon which it is based, and then what you can expect in terms of the next few years with respect to its uh, implementation. But I can't change the slide. Thank you. Uh, this plan has been, uh, as uh, Ms. Dalloweva mentioned, a few years in the making and has take us, taken us on a journey that I believe will result in some significant benefits to the community. 
It's going to guide the planning and delivery of amenities, programs, and services to the community, both in the short term and the long term. And it's based on some key principles that will help guide decisions as we continue with the ongoing implementation. So one of the first uh, tasks and probably the biggest undertaking was a comprehensive assessment of the 18 service areas that are part of the department. These were translated into our service wheel, which provides a visual representation of where we were in terms of the services being provided in each of these areas. And I say where we were as this was completed in 2015, and that's the baseline um, for, the, for the plan. And of course, since that time, we've already started to make changes that to start to shape uh, and change that wheel. So one of the first outcomes of the process was the development of 10 strategic directions or guiding principles. These are the framework within which the plan will operate and highlight some key guiding principles such as working in partnerships, sustaining our assets, and optimizing the use of facilities. And it also provides some key areas of focus such as outdoor recreation, um, festivals and events, and arts, culture, and heritage. So while this plan provides a long-term vision for the next 15 to 20 years, the next five years are considered the first phase, and we intend to look at the service gaps in areas such as heritage, racket sports, cemetery services, and sports fields, as well as initiate uh, pro projects that will maintain service levels in areas such as aquatics, community centers, and festivals and events. The intent of the master plan is to provide an overarching framework um, that will then provide input into the annual business plan and the budget process for council consideration and approval. So in other words, the individual projects and initiatives will be decided by council as part of that regular business planning and prioritization process and will be considered in light of the ongoing demand and changing demand of, for services, funding avail availability, and changing community priorities. Council receives an annual performance report, and the progress on the implementation of this plan will be reported um, as part of that, that current process. In addition, Council has requested that we do a five-year review and update the plan accordingly. We want to make sure that it continues to be aligned with the community's priorities. So in 2020, staff will do a comprehensive review of the progress, and then a second phase of focus will be developed to take us from 2021 through to 2025. And that's my presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Questions from Councillor Hodge? Yes, thank you. Um, this is certainly a, a very important document, and it's going to set the uh, the framework as we go through uh, in, into the future. And this is, uh, I think, uh, you know, something that all of our residents uh, uh, appreciate is what the the work of our, our Parks, Recs, and Culture Department and the services they deliver. And certainly, uh, these services always rate very highly whenever we do the Ipsos Read uh, survey. Something that I think all of our residents, uh, uh, whether it's uh, the parks or community facilities or some of the services, are certainly yeah, highly regarded and and we often hear a lot about the services and and everybody has different services they want uh, you know whether it's in the area of the arts or in sports or, or heritage and uh, and and I think that this does a good job of laying out the, the framework and and a long-term guide to to where we're going but there's there's one area here that's uh, that has concerned me right from the uh, from the beginning of this this process and that's the area on uh, community centers and looking at uh, the, the section on community centers on page uh, 99 of the of the actual of the actual um, uh, plan which is attachment 1 and I look at that it says from 2015 to 2019 um, we're going to begin the work on the, the YMCA, which is undergoing now, and I think that's, that's coming along uh, well. And, and uh, I noticed that uh, New Maillardville Community Center is, is mentioned between 2015 and 2019. That, again, is something that this council has uh, said is an A priority, and I'm, I'm glad to see it's here, and I know work is, uh, is underway there. But um, once these projects are underway, I think that we really need to turn our sights to a new recreation center for the Northeast. And looking at this, and it looks like we're going to, we're going to start planning now, doing the long-range planning between now and 2019, and then between 2020 and 2020, 
2024, another four years, says Northeast Recreation Complex planning. So we've got about seven years of planning, and, and then we, we don't actually, it doesn't actually show up until 2025 to 2029, and I don't even know if that's the start of construction, the opening, or, or what that is. And, and I just don't think that we can spend seven years planning for it, as, as outlined here. And we've heard loud and clear from residents up in the, in the northeast and from the northern part of the city uh, about the need for services in that part of the city. And, and I'm really pleased to see we're moving ahead with the Y and, and Burquitlam and, and Place Maillard replacement down in, in Burquitlam. But I think that we really need to take a look at at this center and, and possibly moving it from that 2029 period over to the 2024 period to send a message that we recognize that we need to get on with services up in that area. We often hear about uh, schools and other things. And, uh, and these are the same people that are, that are saying that, you know, our families are young now, the community is growing, and that we should be providing those services today, uh, not, you know, waiting until the kids are, are older. Uh, and this is, a, this is a neighborhood recreation center that will benefit all Coquitlam residents and reduce the pressure of growth on our facilities, uh, and it could provide a number of community-wide services. Uh, as I went through this report, just figuring out, you know, where to change, it's, it's, I flagged it in about 12 of the 18 different service areas. So it's, it's not just a, an arena or a pool or a library. It's, uh, it's, it's going to have a major impact on a lot of our services. And I think that uh, as we're one of the fastest growing cities in, in British Columbia, and I know we're looking at last week's financial uh, statements, they show we're in good shape financially. I think we said we're up like $40 million increase in, uh, in assets last year. I think that we need to have a, a, take a, a hard look at where we place this, on, on the planning, and this is just a planning document or a, guide, a guiding principle, but I think that we need to actually take a look and sort of say, once we get the Y underway and the Place Maillard going, that it's time to turn our attention to the next center, not leave, say, a, a four-year um, gap in there. Um, I don't know if this, as I said, if this facility, you know, would contain an ice rink or a pool or a library, uh, but we Hopefully it'll have a gymnasium because we know we need gymnasium space and hopefully it will have uh, space for a, a, a daycare and some programming space. But what we do know is that growth is happening in the city. It's particularly happening in the northeast at a, at a pace, I think, faster than many of us expected. Um, and the total number of residents is going to be higher than we expected. And, and I think that we have to uh, move ahead with uh, providing services maybe at a faster pace so that uh, we're providing services for the residents that are paying taxes today and that could benefit from this today. And I just want to see us target a, a rec center for completion, uh, say, at the end of seven years, not the end of uh, seven years of planning for it. So um, I'd like to, to make a motion that uh, we amend this to, uh, to move that from uh, 2025 to, 20, uh, to, to the period between 2020 uh, and 2024. And that would result in uh, the corresponding changes to uh, everywhere else where it's, where it's referenced and, and all the other spots. Okay, so moved and seconded, uh, moved by Councillor Hodge, seconded by Councillor Reed. Um, can you, uh, did the clerk capture the amendment? Yes, what I have um, recorded is Councillor Hodge uh, has moved and Councillor Reed has seconded that on page 99 of the um, Parks, Recreation and Culture Master Plan that the um, Northeast Recreation Complex, which is currently the first item at the top of the 2025 to 2029 column, that, that be moved over and replace the planning portion of the yes. 2020 to 2024 column. Okay, the, the, just a second. Uh, the motion is an amendment to advance the Northeast uh, Recreation Facilities to um, the previous we'll time frame. Move it. And we're going to start a new queue on that amendment, which is on the floor now. On the amendment, Councillor O'Neill. Oh, sorry, second? Uh, we set a secondary queue, so Councillor O'Neill would need to re uh, his mic. Councillor O'Neill. Rekeed, thank you very much. As Councillor uh, Hodge um, pointed out, it would involve uh, changes in about a dozen different timetables. Um, I'm looking, for example, on page 152, Visual Arts, uh, 2020 to 2024, Northeast 
recreation complex planning is there. So there'd have to be changes, uh, olus bolus, to these timetables throughout the plan. Um, and uh, uh, holy mackerel, um, it would be, uh, there'd obviously be some dominoes involved here, and I don't know what those dominoes are. Um, certainly we all recognize the fast pace of growth uh, in the Northeast and the need for facility there. And we also have another hat that we wear up there. We are a landowner there, and you know, having an earlier community center up there might uh, augment uh, the value to the citizens of uh, Coquitlam as well. But this decision has to be made um, uh, with a whole bunch of other information that we don't have. We don't know what, what the dominoes would be, where they would fall, where let's say the, uh, well on that same page for example, we've got uh, 2020, 2015 to 2019 uh, governance, we've got PLEZ is our facility assessment there. And presumably that would lead to, after that assessment is done, there will be something else, but maybe that gets pushed back. Maybe with the domino falling, every whole bunch of other things get pushed back. Um, I, I don't think with, with advancing one uh, quite large project will advance anything else. It will lead to the delay of some other things. I don't know what those are. And I'm not sure if staff could tell us off the top of its head or its two general managerial heads. Um, <laughs> what the, we have to get that in again, right? Yeah, I know what you refer yeah. to staff, so of course the next, uh, the, <laughs> the pronoun would be it. Yeah, so, um, anyway, so maybe uh, if, if um, one of the uh, two-headed managers uh, could rep uh, respond about what, the, what sort of impact we might see if this were to proceed, um, or, or it, I don't expect a specific answer, but in general terms, Advancing a large uh, project like this, what would the uh, impact be? I expect that staff might be of two minds on this question. But, uh, Council, <laughs> Mr. Alaweva. Do have and do have not? <laughs> yes, um, thank you, uh, Your Worship. Uh, we, we are cognizant of um, the growth in the Northeast and um, if, if council will recall uh, some of the background work that went into deciding, you know, priority setting and kind of long-term kind of forecasting, um, part of that was what is going to be in this facility. Uh, there's going to be a facility in, in, in Port Coquitlam. Uh, we've got other facilities that serve that, that larger community. You know, people people uh, utilize recreational complexes th throughout their community, uh, irrespective of, of boundaries. Um, and, and part of what drove, uh, there was a number of factors that drove the, the, the delivery of a new facility up in the Northeast. Um, um, one of them was the uh, availability of our, our land being serviced and available and subdivided and ready for development. And uh, so there's some timing required for that. Another was um, the service level of components of this future facility, including the aquatics, for instance, the aquatics component. The thinking is that there's going to be an aquatic facility within the new facility in the Northeast, um, and the level of service required um, to be established throughout city facilities. Um, and as Council will recall, under the aquatic infrastructure study uh, or strategy, there was a sense that, you know, we would be reaching 90% capacity. And it's really, it's based on metrics to try and make our current facilities as effective as possible and reach maximum optimization before we embark on major, major capital investments that, um, that have a very significant operating impact. Um, just as an example, a facility of, of the size, um, what we're thinking in the Northeast, would probably add about two and a half million dollars worth of operating costs annually, including asset replacement. Um, these are important numbers, and we want to make sure that when it's built, it's built at the right time. At the right time, meaning with service levels that make sense for the community that's going to use them. So there's there's some background information to that. That said, I I think. Council needs to understand that we're we're looking at the situation, you know, regularly, and we do have um, as one of our priority items is to do a northeast recreation um, study, which really tries to determine what's happening in the northeast. We're getting a lot of pressure in Pine Tree Community Center. Um, we're going to be opening up our Smiling Creek facility next year when the school opens, and we're and we're going to try and rationalize the service across the northeast in Victoria Hall as well. 
So the things we are looking at, and part of that assessment might mean that we start looking at the Northeast a little bit earlier, um, you know, and, and, and then we, but we're, but we're moving through a very significant number of priorities here as well. At Plasma Art, it is a major, a major priority. We're doing feasibility work there. We're doing work in the YMCA right now. Very, very heavy, heavy, heavy lifting. Um, all, and, and we can continue to want to push ahead with, um, with the service in the Northeast as well. I want to make sure that it's understood we're on top of that. Um, making a change like this, to me, I'm not sure it's, it's, um, I, I'm challenged by, by a change on the fly because there are other things we have to look at and it does have impact on, uh, on our priorities. But, um, I don't think the number 20, if, if council approves the plan but says that they need, they want to look at it in the earlier period of 25 to 29, well, that's, you can make that resolution. I don't think that would be a significant change to us, but I'm not sure it's meaningful to what council is looking for. Uh, but there are reasons why we put it in that period. That doesn't mean it can't be ahead a couple of years, but the construction alone is going to be two, two and a half years, two years plus. Rezoning um, development of the site alone is a three-year period. So, you know, when you look at what it's going to take to plan this, it's a five-year project from beginning to end, and we're not that far out uh, as we speak. So, Mr. Alueda, that was a very good answer, um, especially because you told me about one thing that I wasn't aware of. You've probably mentioned it before. You're involved in so many projects, and I have a hard time keeping track. But this Northeast uh, Recreation Study that you talked about analyzing, uh, that might be the more appropriate time um, for Council um, to, to look at advancing um, the, uh, the Northeast Rec Complex. If we see at that stage that we're woefully underserved and we better get a move on really quickly, or we're, we're just barely hanging on with the service, especially with the new community center up there uh, and adjacent to the new elementary school. Um, all of that coming to play, then we would say, okay, well, you know what, we're just barely hanging on with this stuff now. We better get moving now on this, advance it. But um, it would be um, rather odd to decide today to move something up um, when a year or two from now, when we see the Northeast Recreation Study, it says, oh, no, we're really right on top of things, and we actually don't need to build this new thing for a while. And I'm, I'm also glad you remind us of the new Port Coquitlam um, recreation. Now, and there is regional uh, balancing that goes on. We know that people from Port Coquitlam and Port Moody use our facilities. Our people use their facilities. I believe Port Coquitlam is putting $120 million into a revamped, uh, expanded uh, recreation for 132 um, yes down in uh, down in Park Oakland so that's obviously going to have an impact as well so I think it would be uh, although I understand the, uh, the sentiment behind the desire to advance this I think it would be uh, precipitous of, it, of us to do so at this time so I will not be in favor of the amendment thank you we're speaking to the amendment uh, to move up Northeast Rec Facilities, Councillor Asmus. Well, thank you. Um, I think this is the wrong time to be proposing that amendment. Uh, we, we've, we've been through this plan and many different points throughout the year, and to change it and make an amendment now would cause, actually we'd have to have the staff take it back and rewrite the whole plan and come back to it. What in the plan it does state, and what staff has pointed out in the, in the report and in the plan, that this is not Fedder Council's ability in the future to make adjustments up or down on which projects they may feel necessary at that time. This is a document that is a guiding document to give us what we need, and, but exactly when we have to, it is not written in stone, and that's flexible. We did go through this before, and we talked about, as Councillor O'Neill mentioned about, that we are going to do the, the study in the Northeast for what are the services that are required up there. And council at that time said, yes, let's get the study done first and then, and that was the decision of all of council, let's get that information first and then, and at that time we were talking about moving it up at that time, then when we get that study back, we will decide on moving it, it up or not. Secondly, we have the Parting Creek Village plan, master plan, that has not even come back for final adoption. And we need that to be put in place and to have that start before we can put in a arena complex. This arena complex could be between 100 and $175 million. 
depending on what we put in there. Because if we put in an arena, if we put in a swimming pool, we put in a gymnasium, because in Port Coquitlam you're at $132 million, those are ice rinks and a, a community center, no pool. There's a bit, are they putting a pool in there? So you're, you're in with, with inflation and everything, you're looking at a huge chunk of money. That's something else that we have to look at. I live in the Northeast, I live in Burke Mountain. Would I want more, so, so yes, but I also realize that I don't believe that this is the time in this report at this time that we have spent a number of years, a couple of years now going through a lot of presentations on this. We just went through a, um, what's in there is the facility needs assessment, trying to balance out those throughout the whole community. We've gone through that. So I'll speak again on this, but I think, I'm not gonna support the amendment to move this up now. I think it's the wrong time to do it. We're not fettered, Councillor Hodge, in doing that in the future when this plan is passed, if it does get passed tonight, that we can make changes in the future. But I think this is the wrong time because I think as Councillor O'Neill pointed out, I think as staff have pointed out, by moving up that one item, it affects 15, 20 other items within the report, and it's, it's not the time to do that. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Reed. Thank you. Well, I supported this because I perhaps look at it a different way. We are going in for the Partington Creek, which is going to be the primo uh, commercial development up there on the mountain. Uh, we have taken um, a lot of information and put it together to try and figure out what it is we need for our master plan up on the mountain. And I think the pace of development has probably gone faster than any of us thought it would five years ago. And I want to be ready. I'm not saying that you have to have the plan done down to the infinitesimal little ladies room, but I expect that we, we would be in a position a little earlier, about five years earlier, in that if I can get uh, developers to come forward, um, uh, big companies like Fortis or Telus or folks like that, to come forward who want to be perhaps a part of the whole uh, <coughs> area up there, the, the Partington Creek Village, and perhaps maybe they would uh, join in and be a partner with us in some of this development because I see this as a really prime area for them. I, I think this is new and innovative and we have lots of opportunity up there. And I want to be prepared a little earlier so that when we have folks coming forward, we can sort of have partnerships available or at least be far enough ahead that we can sort of discuss with the basic square footage, I'll say, that we, we would have available that they may be interested in. I think that the Partington Creek Village is, is it is the, the plan. It is the, the master of all that area that is going to help us complete our, our uh, building on the mountain. And I think we're just putting this off just a bit too far. I don't think we're gonna gather the excitement and perhaps the investment that I really believe that we can. So. I'm not saying you have to have the plan done between 20 and 24, but I'd like to see us move it up a little more. So that's why I'm supporting it. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Marsden. Thank you. Uh, I think Councillors uh, O'Neill and Asmundson have uh, quite eloquently uh, explained the options we've got available to us in terms of flexibility down the road for moving it forward. Um, Councillor Reed's uh, comments with regards to the planning and, and the opportunities, I, I think they're there. And I think they're addressed in here already in 2024. We're looking at the Northeast Rec Complex planning. As we get into that, I think that those opportunities to have the d dialogues with the developers and that, that fits in there already. I, I, so I, I think it's there. Um, so uh, while I would suggest that, you know, we want to see and, and, and move as quickly as we possibly can to move this forward, um, I would be really uncomfortable taking two years of work and a 192-page document and, and then making an amendment to it on, on one item on one page without clearly articulating all the repercussions of it. I just, I, I really struggle with that to look and say, okay, if we, we look to move this forward, we could look and say, well, sure, let's put it in 2020, 2024. That'll, that'll work. Sure, no problem. But how do you deliver it? What are the true implications on that? 
Uh, and I, I think to have a, a dialogue around the table tonight and, and try to grasp those answers and say it, maybe it's a dozen places that are impacted, well, maybe it's two dozen, maybe it's three dozen. Uh, maybe it's the whole financial model in terms of when the money is going to be available to build these pieces. Because when we talk about a lot of these, these projects, it's the money's coming from development cost charges, the money's coming from CACs, the money's coming from bonus densities. And the money may not be there in, in its entirety at that point in time. So that opens up a, a, a whole new challenge where now we're looking to the Municipal Finance Authority to suddenly borrow money while we're waiting for things to happen. Um, Councillor Hodge, you, you pointed out the city's in good financial shape. Absolutely. And I think in large part the city's in good financial shape because in the past there have been uh, appropriate plans made in terms of timing it for when the money's available. And I, I'd be really reluctant to, to, to just make a decision tonight to say let's move this forward so we feel better about it without really understanding the ramifications and the impacts on the rest of the plan including the financial implications. So while I appreciate and respect where you're trying to get to and, and I, I hear the residents up there that want to move things along, I'd like to move it along too, but I think we can achieve that without having to modify this document tonight. Uh, I think we've got the opportunity, as we did in the business planning exercise with Place Maillard, where staff said, let's put it out in this time frame. When we got to that window, we, were able, we looked at staff and said, no, it's time, we need to move that forward. So we've set a precedent and said that yes, we can do that, and I would think that we can achieve it again here. So I think it's important that we look and say, you know what, this is a great, great document, a lot of work has gone into it. This is a, an approximate timeline that we will have uh, the flexibility to move in the forwards uh, in the future, but let's do that with all the information before us as opposed to just looking and saying, I, I think the time's right to do it now. So, um, while I appreciate the intent, uh, I'm not going to be able to support the, the suggested amendment tonight. Thank you. Thank you. I, um, I believe passionately that a goal without a plan is just a wish. And the corollary, of course, is that a wish isn't a plan. Um, I wish we could advance this. Um, and I, in fact, I'd even support language at the top of page 99 that says something like council um, supports uh, to the extent possible, advancing the Northeast Rec Center uh, uh, as much as possible within the, the context of this plan. But I, 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 I agree with those who would argue against um, the amendment. Uh, there was one uh, comment, though, that uh, a council member mentioned. And on the bottom of page 99, um, the bottom right uh, talks, shows the capital plan. And where are, the cap, where are the capital dollars for the Northeast Rec Center in that uh, two call on the table. Uh, Your Worship, um, the the dollars for the Northeast Rec Centre are actually spread throughout the plan. Um, so, for instance, the portion that's related to the arena, potential arena, is in the arena s section. The portion that's related to the community centre, the gymnasium, is in that section. And so it's been spread uh, throughout the various service areas. That's why you don't see a lump sum there. That explains the, the fact that $10 million that's you're going to be really, really efficient with the development of this, uh, this community center. <laughs> two, two washrooms, but only if we're really frugal with them. <laughs> okay, the motion is the amendment. All in favor? All opposed? I've got Councillor Wilson, Asmundson, O'Neill, and myself are opposed. The motion carries. Oh, and Marsden, sorry, I didn't see your hand. Uh, I'll do that again, Councillors Wilson, Marsden, Asmundson, uh, O'Neill and myself are opposed. The motion fails. The, uh, the original motion. We're going to back, go back to the original queue, and I'll go to Councillor Asmundson. Thank you, Mayor Stewart. Well, a master plan, I think if you talk to Mr. Sevlin, some other people have been here, I've been for many, about eight, nine years, pushing to have a master plan for the Parks Department, a guiding document. that, uh, And i got to give staff, when I went through this and I read... I love how it's broken down to all the areas from sport hosting, community centers, park service areas. It's just very easy to read for the people, the visual arts. It covers everything. And you, when you go through this report and you look at it and you go, our parks department provides a just unbelievable amount of facilities and amenities and programs for our public out there. It's, it's quite 
breathtaking when you look at that. And I'm, I'm very pleased with this report. Um, I'm also, this is a living document. When you look at the report and you, in 2017, the tennis and pickleball strategy, facility strategy, a senior strategy, tri-city youth strategy are going to be added. So strategies are going to be continually updated, added into this to keep it fresh and moving forward. So that's why I said earlier about the amendment. This is a document that is constantly a living document that's constantly going to be updated and grow and better refine what we need in this city. And I want to give um, Mr. Alueva, um, Mrs. Hunt, and all the, the people involved in putting this together from the, the service wheel you guys created. I, I just think that this is a document that I think a lot of their departments and planning uh, parks departments will be copying. I'm quite proud of it, and I'm very glad to see it here. That's why I want to make sure it's, it's intact tonight to pass it and get it through. As I said before, you've left it and pointed out that you're not fettering Council's future decisions on moving things around on, depending on those proper discussions, I think, as Councillor Marsden mentioned out when we have the budget, the funding information, everything that goes with that, that we can make those decisions in the whole context the way it should be made. So I'm going to support this. I just want to give hats off to everybody involved in this, Council included. There's a lot of time, a lot of work, but I think we've got an excellent document here. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor O'Neill. Thank you very much. I'll um, echo Councillor Asmussen's comments. Um, when I first got onto Council, um, there were so many new things to learn six years ago almost now. And um, one of the things I learned very quickly was uh, Council's frustration with the lack of a master plan. Uh, every time that would come up, there would be, yes, we need a master plan. I, I remember Councillor Asmussen talking about it, and Councillor the Nicholson as well. <laughs> it used to be quite an aggravating point for him that that there was no master plan and, and seemingly no move afoot to really start one. And um, um, that uh, strong memories about that. So yes, it's been. It's, I know that uh, this this particular document is the result of a three-year process, but uh, it's been on council's agenda for for as long as I've been on council and even longer, um, something that council wanted. So in a way, this is uh, Christmas for us. We're opening the big present here and seeing the final result. Um, I, um, I, I, I was a, a great fan of this uh, delivery wheel when it was first unveiled. Uh, it gave us a very clear picture about where we stood um, and, uh, and uh, where, where uh, progress could be made. Um, I'm looking at the uh, page 12, the uh, service wheel for 2015, and uh, it also projects forward to what the wheel will look like in 2020. Um, um, I'm seeing that there's uh, quite a bit of growth in uh, the recreation and the parks part and improving the delivery, less so in arts and culture. Um, and this is a matter of some frustration. I've been in the uh, arts and culture and now cultural services advisory committee for the entire time I've been on uh, Council, and um, they're a very patient bunch, uh, and uh, they, I, I think they, even though the wheel right now doesn't show a lot of immediate short-term growth, there are a lot of plans that are talked about um, that for a little, that's more medium term, um, everything from um, uh, the use of the Innovation Center to, um, to looking at Plaza des Arts, um, implementation, of course, already happening of the Arts, Culture, and Heritage um, strategic plan. There's a 10 points that are happening already. We had a good meeting of that committee just a few days ago with uh, Councillor Towner at the helm, um, starting to talk about um, the cultural summit that's uh, coming from this. So plans are afoot. Um, it's, it's not short-term fixes right now. It's a little longer term. And so even though this wheel doesn't, doesn't really show that, this wheel shows what's actually going to be delivered in a short term. Um, I'm, I'm happy to support, uh, I'm happy with the progress that's being made. Um, it's a huge and it's complex document, and perhaps a reflection of the fact that there were um, two people at the helm um, that explains the fact that on page 10 at the very top 1.3, uh, we have a document that can be both itself and something bigger than itself at the same time. Um, it says that the Parks uh, Rec Culture Master Plan is contained in two separate but companion documents, the Parks Rec and Culture Master Plan and the Implementation Strategy. So I think what they meant was that this new overall master plan uh, contains two separate but companion documents, the final draft of the Parks Rec and Culture Master Plan 
and the implementation strategy. Because the way it's read, kind of read now, it looks like something is itself and at the same time itself and uh, times two of both. So it doesn't really make sense, but I, I do, am I uh, understanding that correctly or am I, or am I totally twisting the intent of your well-crafted words here? Uh, no, thank you, uh, through the chair. Um, yes, uh, I think you're, you're exactly correct. Uh, it's really a combination of the, the final draft uh, master plan document and then the, the, um, uh, the implementation strategy that followed after. We've just melded those two. I think the wording is... Um, I'd like to think, you know, I am somewhat bigger than myself at times, but, <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, but I can't take credit for that, that line. It was really just... The part a, above your shoulders gets yeah. quite big sometimes. <laughs> yes. Uh, no, it was two documents that were brought together, and um, uh, both have been now melded into the document. Uh, I think Council saw them separately, but we brought them together in this document. And that's great. Uh, that's something that, um, that obviously will, will help the public quite a bit, understanding this. There's a lot of different groups um, because of so many, as I just pointed out, uh, so many different service areas that, are, that, um, that look to this to see what uh, the future will hold for them and, and where the uh, services will be. So I'm an enthusiastic supporter of it. I congratulate uh, everybody involved in this, um, and I look forward to voting heartily in favor of it in a few minutes. Thank you. Councillor Zerillo. Yeah, so amazing. I loved it when I first saw it, and I've continued to think it's in a great document, and I just hope that Council doesn't get in the way of implementing it over the next 10 years. Um, just wanted to talk about one point, which is on page 7 um, on the executive summary, maximizes the use of current parks, rec, and cultural assets. And I just wanted to say that I am a little bit worried about that one sentence in regards to efficiencies. There's a awesome... Uh, if anyone watches a series, The Crown, on Netflix, there's an awesome piece where they're basically talking about how um, there needs to be efficiency and dignity. And I, I totally get the efficiency piece, but I certainly don't want to have efficiency um, get in the way of supporting programs and facilities that are needed for smaller groups or marginalized groups, uh, arts and culture groups. Sometimes they don't have the, the bigger... Um, stein ups like some of the sports do and, I, and we need to protect women and girls around those sort of things so I I, when, what makes me think is we're already talking about amalgamating the program no longer having the, the 50 or the 55 plus program to have one big program the idea of using our pavilions for things other than our seniors which I'm open to that discussion but I just start seeing service losses a little bit there, um, losing outdoor pools because they're no longer efficient, losing curling because it's no longer efficient. So I just, I just see some of that coming, creeping in, and I just want to make sure we keep our dignity as a city and that we do uh, provide service for things that are important to the people in our community, um, especially marginalized and smaller groups. Thank you so much for all this work, and like I said, I hope we don't get in the way of the implementation. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'll actually only have one comment. It was provided by Councillor Reed on page 48. <laughs> um, the grandfather in me looks at that photo and, and suggests that perhaps there was another way to... Um, describe uh, a cooking class of some type <laughs> than a sharp knife wielded by a three-year-old. <laughs> She's not running with it, no. It was mentioned earlier that um, by Councillor O'Neill that um, we had uh, waited a long time for this, and that has been mentioned several times in the course of the development of this document, that uh, this has indeed been a long time coming. Council um, expressed, uh, I remember in the 2005 to 2008 Council, there was expressions of, wouldn't it be nice if we had a plan in a subsequent Council? How long is it going to take for us to get a plan in the next Council? 
Um, how come we don't have a plan yet? And so uh, I'm most pleased at this point to, to be able to see that we now um, have before us uh, an amazing plan. And on, be on behalf of my colleagues, I want to extend our thanks to those that were involved in its development. Um, certainly all those staff members, but there's also a lot of community groups and a lot of uh, folks in our, in our city that have a passion for uh, the parks and for the recreation facilities that make our community what it is. And so thank you for that. And I'm now going to call, seeing no speakers, I will call the question on the motion, the original motion, because the amendment failed, the, on the motion. All in favor, all opposed, carried unanimously. Next item, item 8, pertains to the litter and desecration prohibition bylaw, which is bylaw number 4762. Staff recommendations that Council give first, second, and third readings to litter and desecration prohibition bylaw number 4762, and first, second, and third readings to bylaw notice enforcement amendment, litter and desecration prohibition bylaw number 4783. Moved by Councillor Reed, second by Councillor O'Neill. Councillor O'Neill. Yes, if I read this correctly, a part of this uh, update is to uh, repeal a bylaw that uh, is even older than me. <laughs> really? <laughs> yes, hard to believe. Uh, but there's a bylaw that the Corporation of the District of Coquitlam passed in 1950. In order to repeal that, do you have to break the tablets or do you just. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. I did, I did see that, and I, and I have one comment, wow, I uh, haven't seen anything like that, but it's always good when you can spot those things. And uh, there used to be a TV show uh, yes. on CBC about... Uh, about uh, and it was called... Arcane, out-of-date laws that they would find, and it was kind of a comedy show. And um, I'm not sure how... Soupy sales. Um, yeah, I'm not, I thought it was a Canadian one. Anyway, um, I'm not sure exactly what's in this old bylaw, but there's probably a few things that would generate a, the odd snicker. Um, and uh, glad that you spotted it and uh, gotten rid of it, but uh, I'm not ready to be gotten rid of yet myself. So thank you. Um, Councillor Towner. Hi, thank you. I just have a couple of questions. Um, as I was reading this... It piqued, um, piqued my curiosity that it says here on page three that the city has a comprehensive graffiti enforcement program, and in 2015, we developed a smartphone app. I've called in graffiti a few times, and I looked for the app, and I couldn't find it. Do you know what it's called? Do we still have it? Uh, through the chair, that's a good point of clarification, Councillor Towner. It's an app that our enforcement officers use, so oh. it's an enforcement tool. Uh, we are always looking ways to be more efficient and more innovative, and certainly a public-facing app is something that we've talked about as well. So you will be our guinea pig if and when we get to roll that out. Okay, so it's not for the public. It's not an app. And just so you know, in two, two spots on our website, it, it prompts the public to download the fact sheet, and the fact sheets aren't there. I don't know if somebody wants to look into that. I can show you where... Anyways, I did some research as I was reading this report. Um, so on page two, it says that staff has identified increasingly frequent problems with large construction materials and hazardous waste dumping. That's partly what prompted this report. I'm just curious, we're, we're doing this, it's great to have these bylaws, but how do we, how do we enforce, how do we catch the people that are is there any thoughts of putting in cameras or taking any measures to at the areas where this has increased? Because if we have these bylaws, how do we enforce them if we if it's after the fact? Uh, through the chair, Councillor Towner, those are some excellent questions that raise the practical challenges of enforcing any kind of littering or dumping bylaw. Uh, this is the the general bylaw. It applies to all public places, roads, boulevards, parks. Uh, there are additional provisions in some site-specific bylaws, like the Parks Community Facilities Bylaw. That's the more logical place for enhanced enforcement tools, such as um, cameras. Uh, not widely used in Coquitlam, and, and I don't think widely used amongst other municipalities either. Uh, the, the couch in the bushes at the end of a cul-de-sac, we're never going to be able to capture that with video cameras. Uh, but one of the goals of this bylaw modernization was to ensure that the offense charging language was broad enough that we could capture 
not just the person physically dumping the couch out, out of the truck, but the registered owner of the truck, because we're much more likely to get a call from a member of the public with a license plate number that we can trace back to somebody than a visual identification of the actual person engaged in the dumping. So that was the primary enforcement benefit of the modernization, was just broadening that language somewhat. Okay, thank you for that clarification. Thank you. Um... Oddly enough, someone sent me a, um, a story about a mayor in France that uh, do, does things. I guess I gather that in France, mayors have a little bit more authority than here in Canada. But the mayor in France um, has the uh, when he when they catch an illegal dumper, they uh, uh, collect and gather up all of the illegally dumped materials and they dump it in the garage of the person that uh, actually they deem to be responsible and they actually have a video several videos on YouTube where the truck backs up and dumps stuff into the into the single car garage of, of some apparent perpetrator um, but there's no question that these kinds of, of challenges uh, are, are things we struggle with uh, as a community that we uh, um, it's a, it's a frustration that many residents talk about but one of the things they they also talk about and we're I think the, the opportunity right now is right now. Um, the, uh, I'll call it littering because when people take either glue or duct tape and they tape a, a poster to a, one of the freshly painted and installed lamp standards in our city center for some kind of uh, pay by the phone call temp job or, or some you know, for the most recently garage sales and those sorts of things, it, um, we all remember what the old lamp standards looked like in our city centre before we spent a lot of money renewing our Pine Tree Corridor and other corridors, Millardville is the same. Um, can we not uh, uh, go to greater lengths to prohibit the postering of uh, uh, street furniture, in our, particularly in our city centre? Uh, Your Worship, that, James. that is a, a subject matter that's regulated under um, other bylaws, so largely dealt with in the postering bylaw. There is a specific bylaw that addresses that. It is something that we enforce proactively, so we uh, assign that to some of our roaming officers. They have um, areas that they cover. They know the hot spots, so they're fairly quick on the draw to uh, identify the, the responsible party and by their very nature, those signs tend to clearly indicate who the postering party is, and we deal with them quickly uh, with the full extent possible. Because I've taken some down myself, and, I, and I've, I've asked engineering in the past whether it's possible to have a, a very small, very unobtrusive um, notice um, stuck on the, that kind of furniture to make, that simply says that, no, you can't put your poster here. Uh, something that would be durable enough to to stay and not be messy, but also uh, small enough so that you have to be trying to install a poster uh, in order to see it. And I, I'll put that back to engineering. I don't need an answer. I don't just don't know whether it's possible to um, uh, step in and kind of let people know that this is against a bylaw and that you can't put even your garage sale, your lost cat, um, whatever, on the... Okay, I lost yet lost cat, did I? Yeah. <laughs> okay, okay. Your, your garage sale, etc. And I'm, I don't know if staff had a response, but none necessary. Uh, Your Worship, I'd just add, and, and again, I'd like to thank and acknowledge uh, the contributions of Sarah Bull to this project. Uh, Sarah's one of our bylaw supervisors. Council may recall that this, um, this is phase two of a project that we undertook last year, our Evergreen Preparedness Project. As we were anticipating 30,000 new riders arriving through our community every day, we wanted to make sure that all of the bylaws under our division's control, the public place bylaws, were um, fit for the bill, for, for the job. Uh, Sarah was our lead on that project, and she's continued some excellent work this year with the implementation phase of this updated uh, litter and desecration bylaw. She was kind enough to remind me that one of the provisions in this new bylaw is, uh, it deals with damage to municipal property. So that could be a, a ticket that we could look at, and it carries a, a fairly substantial fine in the recommended Ben amendments that we could look at in situations of actual you know, quite permanent or more severe damage to uh, street infrastructure such as lamp posts or benches through postering or otherwise. Thank you very much. And finally, Councillor O'Neill mentioned uh, the, um, I guess, the repeal of a bylaw that was written in 1950, and I actually was curious enough to have a look at it. Um, so one thing it did, that bylaw prohibited 
privy closets from being built within the residential area. That means uh, effect of 1950, you could no longer build an outhouse in the residential area. And by 1951, you had to have a water closet in every home, every commercial building and such had to be served by a water closet. Um, there, were, there was one other provision, and I must say that I am in conflict because I have broken, since that is still in, a, in effect, I have broken that bylaw uh, because it says you're not allowed a fur-bearing animal, including a rabbit or a hamster, in the residential area or in a residential building. Uh, and I, of course, our family has raised rabbits, and, um, and you just referred to Councillor Towner as a guinea pig. Those ones, um, those are illegal. <laughs> those are... So, those are illegal in Coquitlam until we repeal these bylaws. And uh, the fine, that I'll tell you, the penalty is up to $100 and two months in Ocala with or without hard labor. Wow. Okay, so that's it. The motion. Oops, Councillor Reed. Well, as far as the bunny bylaw goes, um, it was changed in the 90s, the early 90s. And the reason I remember it is because the mayor then, Lou Sikora, and I were having a big verbal argument um, on what is a bunny and what is a rabbit. The fur was flying. And the, uh, the fur was flying, and the next day the two newspapers, one said, bunny bylaw bugs may, and the other one was, Reed wants equal rights for rabbits. I remember that. So I will tell you, it has been changed back in the 90s somewhere. That's a hair-raising story. I'll tell you. Oh. Equal rights for rabbits. That's me. Okay, well, we're going to vote on it now. Okay. <laughs> the question is first, second, third reading of the litter and desecration prohibition bylaw and the bylaw force, a notice enforcement amendment bylaw and the repeal of something. All in favor? Opposed? And that carries unanimously. Move adjournment. Okay. Councillor Asmussen moves adjournment, seconded by Councillor O'Neill. All in favor? Opposed? Carried unanimously. I will now open the floor to any questions from the audience on any items in tonight's agenda. Are there any audience members who have any questions for council on tonight's agenda? Any, any questions at all? Any questions? We thank you all for coming and for staying to the end of the meeting. Thank you. All the best.